Thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, I lead the Autonomous Robotics and Perception Group at uh, Boulder. Um, it's a rather large bay away, large prehistoric bay away from here. Uh, and so, um, and I'll be talking today a little bit about some work that's going on in my group about uh, robotic perception, especially in challenging environments, like in caves, but in also types, different types of environments. But before we do that, we have to show a video about some of the, I mean, everyone's seen this video. It's like, wow, what can robots not do, right? I mean, who here's a roboticist? A few of you. Okay, that's what I feel. Everyone, I expect. Um, and we look at this and we're like, okay, well, it must be sort of like hand engineered and stuff like this. And it probably is. And state feedback is nearly perfect. You have a LIDAR. It's, they only show their successful events, right? So they probably had 100 of these videos in which it failed previously. And so this is, but still pretty impressive, even like the arrogance that the platform can show by putting its hands in the air at the end. Um, and if you look at other types of different examples for robotic autonomy, this is uh, some work out of Georgia Tech's auto rally car, fairly a few years old at this point, using differential GPS to be able to drift around corners on this small type of vehicle. Um, I think it's like a one-fifth scale vehicle. Uh, and they have uh, essentially, you know, like a small compute platform already on it and GPU. It's all on board, uh, except for the GPS component for, for its state estimation. And um, of course, this has hit the news. Congratulations. I mean, this is so exciting to see. Really has captured the attention and imagination of many people. Being able to do these kinds of aggressive maneuvers on full-size vehicles is even more challenging than being able to do it on these toy vehicles, like what we do in my group. Um, this is some work that we did uh, several years back, about six years ago at this point, being able to drive these small ground vehicles on uh, kind of terrain park types of environments. And again, every person in, in the room that has done any sort of research in robotics sees first, okay, uh, pretty impressive maneuvers, but also they, you can't help but look at the motion capture system and realize that even through these types of events, you know, like being able to jump and everything like that, that the mocap is providing us one kilohertz state feedback at almost perfect accuracy, what we would normally ground truth our perception algorithms against. Um, the hope, obviously, is to be able to remove all of the different external types of state estimation capabilities from uh, this type of problem and be able to reproduce these results in wild environments, places where we haven't been before, where maybe we have been, but we don't have any kind of external ground truthing or fiducial, fiducial systems involved. And the, that is also a fairly rosy picture. So this is also fairly old work. Project Tango, about seven years ago, being able to do 3D reconstruction with a simple stereo camera on a cell phone at real time. And what we can see here is 3D models, fully fused 3D models of the environment, things that you can then import into game engines and be able to simulate physics over, right? So we can actually build models of the environment like what we have here, and then be able to say, how would a ball, for instance, interact with this environment? And if a ball, then why not a car? Right? So this is the back end, if you will, to that whole control system that I was showing about that car that was jumping on the ramps and doing the loops. This is a physics environment being simu or simulating this, this uh, model of a car over the 3D fused model that we had built from perception. Right? But, the, but the huge like, gimmick here is that we're doing that state feedback through, through motion capture. And just to, in case you're wondering, well, how does this happen? You see these lines sort of like, you know, uh, just uh, coming straight from the vehicle at the front of it. Those are all different, like simulated worlds. What would happen if I just added a little bit more gas, turned maybe half a degree more to the right on this vehicle at this particular point in time? Those are what we call control candidates, and we choose our best one in a, in a sort of framework frequently called stochastic model predictive control. And that's, that's all stuff that we, many of us have seen before, right? And if you've been to ICRA, then this is, or IROS, these are, these are different kinds of capabilities that have been developed for, for years. And yet we still don't see um, too many places where we can, uh, we can migrate this to the wild. In fact, you know, like I want to show, like, this is actually fairly difficult to do. It's not like mundane. This is a human operator attempting to drive the vehicle through this loop, and here's a well-paid postdoc uh, <laughs> nearly getting his head cut off because of this car that's going to run into him. Um, yeah, and doing some superhuman capabilities you know, on his own as well. Um, 
So, you know, and just to recall for you, that's, that's, a, that's a graduate student attempting to drive that car through that, that loop. A graduate student who I promise you has spent a little bit too much time driving this car around uh, because it's so much fun. Um, whereas the computer can do it without any problem at all, right? Very reliably and robustly. Um, so the question then becomes, where are these autonomous vehicles? I've given you some indication that, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of promise uh, that we can see in the field of autonomous robotics today. We have perception and all of the great advances that have happened there. We have control, and I've shown you some superhuman-like types of control and planning capabilities. So where are these autonomous vehicles? And let me show you another video of, um, you know, maybe uh, the state of the art, if you will, um, where, you know, everyone's seen this video from the DARPA Robotics Challenge, the finals back in 2015, some of the best teams uh, that build robots uh, trying to field them in this really high stakes environment and having failure modes and that, that they've never seen before uh, and not being able to really accomplish the challenge as they would hope. And you see graduate students and postdocs in this video realizing that they have to work for years longer, right? Uh, their, their degrees are pushed out that much further. And I mean, the reason why, I mean, many of you probably work in different areas here, right? Some of you work in perception and you're going to say, these are all perception challenges or, or control and say, well, inverted pendulum problems in uncertain or uneven terrain are very difficult. Um, some of you look at, you know, ty different types of human supervisory interfaces, human factors, the ways that humans are interacting with these robots, providing commands or planning methods. These are all at fault, right? So I can't really blame just one of these components. It's because the interplay between these components is so complex and it's really a high dimensional world we're dealing with and an uncertain one uh, at that that require us to you know, give a little bit more research and um, is, is fairly, the, the, the human, the, the sort of autonomous robotics future is still very far off. Um, of course, as a perception person, uh, I'm interested actually in this particular scene. Does anyone know what happened in this scene? Just take a Yes. They thought they were grabbing the uh, the valve, and they thought they had it, and they went and did the motion, and they didn't have it. Excellent. Yeah. So there was no torque to balance the torque that they were applying, and so they fell right over. Right. And so, to me, this is kind of at this interface between perception and control. Right. It's clearly there's some there's some sensors here, um, and the sensors got this robot to the red valve, but the sensors maybe weren't in the right place one could argue, or maybe they were in the right place, but no, no, there was some sort of behavioral tree issue or something like this. The, there was no uh, perception fed back into the contr controller that said, make sure that your grasp is actually on the red valve. So it fell over. And in autonomous vehicles, which is something that you know, is near and dear to my heart still, um, you know, we, we look at problems like this where we say, OK, there's a camera and maybe multiple cameras and LIDAR and everything else. Um, as a human, we might be saying we could we could see that this looks fairly uh, you know, mundane kind of driving situation, but with a little bit closer because of this lens flare that happens right here, um, as you move forward, then there are some weird effects of the auto exposure on the camera, also revealing that there are threats that exist ahead of us. So there are just these little tiny like problems associated with where are you looking, how are you looking, and are you actually taking into account the kinds of things that uh, could result in cat catastrophe for you. OK, so this is more motivational. Um, and you know, this is meant to be able to scale to environments of arbitrary complexity. So driving in India, never done it before. Uh, everyone tells me it's absolute, tr like, you know, just complete sensory overload. Um, and what we have here is, how would we be able to program an autonomous agent in an environment where we have to like, be modeling each of the possible future directions of this kind, these agents here, right? So I was just like sitting in a, in a self-driving car yesterday and I was truly impressed at the ability for that car to be able to identify all of the, the pedestrians in the scene. Like at one point there was like a head that was like going into a subterranean passageway and the car was able to tell even in the like crazy rain that there was this person. It was like 50 meters away, like remarkable, right? But try doing the sort of stochastic model predictive control over all future trajectories of these agents, right? And then even going a step further, asking questions like, is this person angry? Can I apply rational models of motion to this car that he is driving? 
Is this person paying attention? Is this sort of like, you know, on the phone or just scratching his ear? Maybe these vehicles can't turn because they're weighed down by a certain amount of load that limits their maneuverability. And also questions like, you know, should I even listen to this stop sign? Is it visible by our, all parties and obeyed? Clearly not, all right. So what I mean to point out from all this is that the world is not like this nice, like modelable environment in many ways. The ways that we sort of look at stochastic model of predictive control and the reduction of perception and state estimation into the inputs to that control system. So the world is not this, you know, sort of nice, drivable uh, road where nothing's going to happen or maybe very few things would happen, right? And I know that uh, this next uh, slide might be a little bit difficult for you living in California, um, but the world is more like this, right? Uh, where there's snow and where different kinds of disabled vehicles might sit on the road. And we have to start asking, you know, like, can we actually model every single scenario in which, for instance, two versus three versus five people are out pushing a vehicle along the road? Okay. And furthermore, if we're driving in this, how do we know what kind of controllers to apply? Uh, the stochastic model predictive control framework that I was talking about before requires our knowing at least some idea about what our friction coefficients are, for instance, or how our interactions between wheels and the ground are going to work. And in really complicated scenarios uh, for contact, granular, granular media or other types of stick-slip conditions like this, that's actually really challenging to be able to model. Okay, and so... I'm motivated now, not by self-driving cars, but by what DARPA is paying me to be interested in, uh, which is truly a remarkable, in my opinion, type of environment, the subterranean environment. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about this now and hopefully connect uh, all the ideas that I've talked about before with this. So here's this uh, you know, entrance to a cave, a fairly standard cave that we might be required to enter for the subterranean challenge which requires our putting teams of robots into mines, tunnels, urban undergrounds, and caves to be able to find certain artifacts, what uh, DARPA has claimed as artifacts, which might be things like red backpacks, fire extinguishers, survivors, things of this nature. Okay, um, I'm sure many of you look at this environment and say, I am super excited to send robots into aqueous environments, right? Uh, the, the number one cause of catastrophe at the subterranean challenge that just happened and uh, hope probably in the future ones was water falling on a computer and that just, you know, the robot doesn't move after that. So the environments look like this where there might not be this sort of crawler in here but instead, you know, there's going to be small and large types of obstacles that we have to negotiate. In this environment, you could imagine putting in a ground vehicle but maybe an aerial vehicle would be a better choice. Remember, we can send teams of robots in, which means that we can choose what kind of locomotion we'd like. Um, even then, if you ever do any kind of quadrotor flying, uh, autonomous quadrotor flying in something like this, you could imagine things like prop wash and sort of you know, these small obstacles that you wouldn't be able to see necessarily with a LIDAR, even a very high density LIDAR, causing some issues, right? And I also want to, in particular, draw your attention to a couple of features on this image right here. This specular highlight up here as a result of a light being too close to the geometry, uh, the, the walls here, and then also um, reflections as a result of uh, just specular, uh, specularities on surfaces. Things that really, if you work in vision, then these should frighten you, right? Uh, these are places where we don't have very good models, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. But before I do, I want to motivate just a little bit more about this subterranean challenge. Here we are in the systems competition. We're in so my team um, is in so-called Track A, which is one of the DARPA-funded teams. We just finished this tunnel circuit, which is going in environments not too different uh, than the one I just showed. But then also that we have the so-called urban circuit next, and then finally a cave circuit six months after that. This is going to be in February. And then finally, a year to sort of winnow down our methods and then get them to a final systems test um, event. And so um, there's also a virtual competition. We're not part of one of those. We're just in this one little track up here, just to explain to you where this sort of competition is. And my role on this team is to sort of help um, and uh, chiefly solve some of the perception challenges associated with operating in, in these mines. And the normal ways that I would try to 
solve these problems are using sensor suites like this one in techniques known as sensor fusion. A um, little bit more than just Kalman filtering, we usually use optimization-based approaches. And if you, again, work in this field, then um, the difference between the two is, is uh, it's kind of subtle, I suppose. But um, in the end, it's taking all these different types of data, distilling them into data products that then we can do some sort of estimation over. Um, so cameras, they obviously provide us images, which provide us information on both where we are, how we're moving, and what's around us. It's very, inf very useful information. GPS, if available, gives us only pseudo-ranging positions. Um, encoders might be on wheels or something, or be able to tell sort of how to impute the way that the physical model of your robot would be able to give um, motion prediction. Inertial measurement units, which come in all shapes and sizes, but in general, uh, they're useful for rotation rates and acceleration. And finally, different types of LIDAR solutions, um, which give us direct depth uh, estimate or measurements on surfaces in, in a 3D space. Um, potentially 2D space, although we only use 3D LIDARs in our, envir in our environments. Again, like self-driving cars are the true, like a very motivational case, right? I mean, they, they sort of pushed the bounds of what is available for centrifusion using essentially everything that you could imagine. They also have GPS on top of this sensor suite here for different types of capabilities. And the fusion of these capabilities provide that sort of really high, highly accurate information, right? So that's kind of why I was mentioning that pedestrian example. Um, being able to tell a pedestrian very far away may not be only dependent on a camera, but also dependent on, on LIDAR. And so it's the sort of tessellation of these different sensor nets and the ways that they all work together that we're interested in. Now, the, one of the chief problems uh, in, in moving a robot in an unknown environment, removing that motion capture, is being able to solve state estimation. So in order to do this, one of the typical tools that's used and well known in the literature now is Visual Simultaneous Localization and Mapping, or SLAM. Now the visual part has a lot of different methods. There are things known as indirect methods, sparse indirect methods, which re revolves around being able to compute features in a computer vision frame, being able to capture a frame from a camera, calculate where there are features, being able to match those features in time, and being able to, as you can imagine, estimate how you're moving against those features in an environment. Similar to how we might be able to do navigation against corners in this 3D environment, let's say. Um, so up here is the sort of features and as they're tracked across frames. Um, and then here is what we call a pose graph, as well as landmarks in this environment. One can augment this with a little bit of that sensor fusion technology that I was talking about to solve so-called visual inertial slam, which involves both the vision and the introduction of an IMU. That helps us in places where, let's say, there aren't many features, like on the ground right here, and also be, is able to help us sort of work through places where we might not have any feature correspondences between frames. And the particular advantage here is if you get motion blur, right? Okay, so let's just take a, take a moment and appreciate those two sensors. Cameras provide us relative pose constraints, that is frame-to-frame -frame tracking, as well as information on structure, that landmark data. And IMUs provide us some strong short-term spatiotemporal constraints, or the ability for us to be able to sort of forward propagate our state between frames that, that are uh, collected. And whether or not we may have dropped a frame because there are no features, because there's entirely motion blur, or maybe it was overexposed, those are examples of places that an IMU is absolutely critical. Now there's this one little problem, right? And this is sort of gonna get us in introduced into the world of sensor fusion and perception today, which is that if you have an IMU sitting somewhere arbitrarily on your robot body, and you have a camera that is also sitting somewhere on that robot body, ideally there's going to be some static transform between the two, right? Who here has done a sensor calibration before? Okay, so almost everybody. Sensor calibrations involve moving a rig, right? and being able to determine moving a rig against this fiducial target and being able to regress certain quantities of interest, being able to get SE3 offsets, XYZ, roll pitch yaw, translation orientation, differences between the two sensors, right? Being able to capture maybe intrinsics of the camera as well, lens coefficients for distortion, maybe focal point and central point as an example, okay? And 
This is like what graduate students have to do every day, let's say, that they want to be able to run one of their perception rigs. It's, it's extremely harrowing and time consuming. Okay. And, you know, so, so introduces perhaps one of the least sexy, but also one of the most lucrative parts of doing perception, which is that nobody wants to do sensor calibration and everyone needs to do it in order to use mul multiple sensors. So we made plenty of papers and like different grants and cooperative research agreements between companies to be able to solve these like very particular types of recalibration problems on the fly. And I'm going to tell you about one of them right now. But the reason why we would have to do this is, OK, fine. Let's say you're OK with an engineer doing that whole sensor rig dance. What happens when someone out in the field decides that they would like to move one of the cameras with respect to the other sensors on the platform? Or let's say perhaps that you're doing some fairly you know, aggressive maneuvers, and now you ran into something or you had a hard stop, and that might actually result in a different kinds of cal different calibration or change in calibration parameters. Or maybe you, something unexpected happens, and as a result, yard sale, sensors fly. And what you don't want to do is have to send your car or your rig back to the shop to get recalibrated, because it needs to continue operating. Maybe not in this example, but you can imagine. So, we were interested in trying to solve a camera to IMU self-calibration problem. This is very helpful for us as we're moving in the mines, but also was helpful all the way back when we were working with Toyota. So in this case, we want to compute this camera to IMU uh, rotation and translation. Let's say that your camera intrinsics are nice and fine. We're not going to change anything. This is hard because we don't have any calibration target as we're operating. We need to do this in real time, and it needs to be robust to these sorts of changes that happen on the fly. And the way that we solve this problem is by collecting the most informative motion segments to estimate the parameters. And then we detect and account for changes that negate older seg segments' informativeness. That is to say, we ask the question, is this new information that we just got telling us something that disagrees with our previous hypothesis for where, what our sensor calibration parameters were? OK. Like I said, we worked on this for a few years. And this was, the, I think, one of the more robust solutions that we came up with which involves this. We, move our, we are moving our robot, right? We're just kind of evolving and wherever we, we're sort of moving through this environment. And we capture a subsample of the motions of the robot. And with those motions of the robot, we take an estimate as to what our calibration parameters are. This involves some, some nonlinear optimization, which results in some, un some error, right? This error is indicative of what our uncertainty is on that, that, those sets of calibration parameters. What we're going to do with that is sort of store these three motions and throw those motions as well as the estimate for the calibration parameters into a priority queue like this. And as we evolve the robot forward, we're going to be collecting more and more motions, some of which may not be informative. Right? You can imagine in this case, it's not always that every motion that you take is actually going to help you regress these parameters in sensor calibration. And so here's one example in which the information was not so great. There's a sort of wider spread on what our estimation would have been for the calibration parameters. But we throw those into the priority queue anyway, and we continue evolving. So you could see that this works until the priority queue is full, right? After which, we run an estimation over all the different motions in this priority queue in order to get our calibration parameters. Now we continue evolving our robot, just normally operating, and we ask the question, since our priority queue is full and we have this new, motion or this new motion sample, how informative is this motion sample against previous, previous uh, motion sa samples? And in this case, we can say, as you can see, that the, there's actually this one is slightly more narrowly peaked, if you will. That is to say, it's more informative. It is less uncertain about the particular par parameter that is than one of the motion samples still in the priority queue. So we bump that out. And we throw it in and re-estimate. This is a way, just one particular way that we came up with that involves being able to do this online self-calibration. OK. And we throw away other le less informative samples as we go. So the, the key takeaway here is that, OK, well, we can actually run this robot in, in this environment, have somebody move, this, move the sensor with respect to all the other sensors, and then be able to say, oh, it turns out that all of our previous sensor calibration or all of our previous motion samples are wrong. That means the sample 
sample now is telling us that there's been a change and our calibration parameters need to be readjusted. So you can see this is actually does work in real time. Somebody went and adjusted that and we're still not losing tracking entirely. We have normally what you'd get at this point is like a seg fault. Like none of our calibration, none of our SLAM solutions are actually converging. But in this case, we were able to recalibrate and move forward. But I'm going to step back on a meta level here. Right. So maybe you don't care about sensor calibration like many of us. We just hope that it can be solved. right? But the key takeaway here is that perception and action inform one another. Certain motions were helpful. Other motions were not. Okay? And in doing that, we've sort of identified a region that tells us, OK, we need to move our platform in a certain way in order for us to have robust perception. Okay? Not just that, but also probably we need to be able to get robust perception in order to know whether or not a certain action is available. Let's say we don't have it, there's, there are, there's too much uncertainty on our map, for instance, and that those map uncertainties will cascade into being able to, not having a very good guess as to how our platform will work in a certain environment. So stochastic MPC then would fail. So this is a fairly like general takeaway that I, I'm using is sort of, I'm using this one example that I provided is just one, one uh, sort of tableau, if you will, for this lesson. I'm going to launch into another example of this. Okay, so hopefully, if, you, if you're cool with you know, sensor calibration, you kind of get it. Um, maybe keep this in mind as we go forward. So let's focus again on this subterranean environment. So here's, here's our sort of most commonly used robotic sort of uh, platform for prototyping. It's this little, what we call a parkour car. And it's driving in this environment that's dark, just like the mines that we expect to be operating in. Okay. And what we've done is we've attached a light on the top of the, of the platform because it needs to see where it's going, right? There's no light. And what we've done is we've also have this camera. And what you see here is the first image is when the robot was sort of maybe a few meters further away from it of this volleyball. And now we've moved closer. And what we've done is captured another image of this, of this volleyball. A couple things have happened, right? We see now that there's a very direct specular highlight on the volleyball, which means that if we were to look at this volleyball and say, where are my computer vision features, that might not be so useful, you can imagine, because this looks like a white surface now. We've sort of overexposed all of the texture and features on this volleyball. The second thing is, so maybe that's fine, I mean, because you're saying, OK, well, I'm only looking at how this shifts in the image. Maybe the colors will shift in the image. The second is that the, the way that the volleyball looks apparently is different, right? which means that any kind of direct image matching that you would do, being able to say, how does my scene look as I'm moving forward, you can't really apply that anymore because the scene has changed merely by your motion in it because you have that light on, on top of you. right? And this is not an uncommon circumstance in mines. Let me show you the same video of us walking through a mine here. This is the Gold King mine in Colorado, if any of you are familiar with that disaster. What we've done is we've taken one flashlight, which is sort of diffuse here, walking through this mine. Here's another example of us walking through a mine with a different flashlight, lower setting. We've reduced the brightness setting here. What you can see is a few more sort of shiny surfaces and a lot more texture. Okay? But what you also see is that the, the throw of the light is not quite as great. Right? So you can't really see so much about the geometry further out. And this, this projector, is sort of, you could see a little bit more than this. The projector is sort of reducing some of that, that visibility range. And the, the final one is you know, if you thought one light was was just, you know, maybe we'll change the setting on one light for brightness. Here's two lights that you could use, sort of one that's focused down into the, the cavern, and then one that's sort of uh, broader at a wider angle to be able to hopefully capture both of them. But that was even more confusing, right? We just were looking at that video, and it's like, wow, what's moving around me? Because lights are moving with respect to one another. The way that the light plays against the geometry here in order to create shadows as well as be able to, uh, as the image is being generated, um, show texture as well as different kinds of geometry is what we want to discuss. So 
turns out no one's really looked at this type of problem before because I believe no one wants to use visual methods in caves, right? I believe visual methods are sort of what humans can use, so I want to be able to apply those to robots. So what we did was what any good you know, scientist does is say, well, if I'm going to be testing any of my methods that I'm going to be developing here, I'm going to first take a data set. So the data set that we took was in three different types of environments, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, these sorts of caves, and uh, a more urban environment, and then an outdoor environment. Um, we also worked in, uh, with different types of sensors. So we captured the data with a RealSense D435i, which if you don't know is a RealSense D435. It gives us 8-bit grayscale, 1280 by 720. We had two of these cameras hooked up, um, 30 hertz, uh, 30 frames per second data on each one of those camera feeds. The, if you've worked with one of these cameras, then you sort of know, wait, there's an RGB as well. But the RGB is rolling shutter, so we, we throw that out. We don't use that, uh, although we captured it if you want it. Um, we have two IMUs. One of them is the one that's inherent on the RealSense D435i. It sort of acts like the Bosch IMU in case you've ever used that one, but we don't, I've never torn it apart, so I don't know what's actually on it. But it's sort of like that, 250 hertz, and a gyro at 400 hertz. Um, a much nicer IMU, about $1,000, uh, 3DM GX515 from Lord MicroStrain gives us um, actually up to 1,000 hertz uh, accelerometer and gyro, but it's just much more stable and lower bias drift. Um, as well as, as much as we could, some position according to like a total station. Um, I'll talk about that in a sec. As well as a light that we change the different illumination settings on. And as you can see here, what the sort of examples of environments that we took this data set were in were a tunnel, a mine, a lab, and an outdoor environment. Um, and I'll show you videos of those in a second. Uh, and um, OK, so let's talk about it. Here was the rig. We have this Leica prism up here. In order for us to get ground truth for as long as the Leica uh, laser was available, as you can imagine, if we operate in mines and we're going around corners, we can't actually move the Leica station. So that means that only por portions of this uh, pose graph will actually have ground truth according to the Leica. We have a computer on board. We have the, this camera, the two cameras right here. Batteries, lots of batteries for all the computer and everything. And then the IMU both in here as well as the Lord MicroStream behind it. And to show you this, this light here, I mean, this light, just a pretty typical LED with a massive heat sink that would create enough heat to sort of heat the mines that we were in with a fan on the back to make sure that we didn't like overheat the LED itself. So this thing, when it was cranked up, was basically the light of day. Um, here are the different environments that we were operating in. Here was a steam tunnel type of environment in our, in our underground at uh, the University of Colorado. And so this was taken at those different brightness settings, different lumen settings on the, on the light. And we tried to recreate the path as well as possible. But as you can see, we were walking around in this environment. And this, this does have auto exposure enabled. Um, and the light will be, is calibrated. And I'll show that in just a second. So here's the, the uh, urban underground. This is uh, a tunnel cave type of environment that we were operating in. Um, and then finally, to make this the creepiest data set ever collected, uh, the Blair Witch Project style outdoors type of uh, runs here. So you can see that we tried to capture a bunch of different scenarios in which one wanted to do active illumination. And furthermore, uh, we tried to capture those different settings with different types of motion blur types of characteristics. So for instance, if you're operating at the brightest setting, it might be that you don't get as much motion blur. But at the lower setting, it might look like you have the same image, but there's more motion blur. So those are some sort of uniquenesses about this data set. The last thing, like I mentioned, is we did that light intrinsics uh, calculation. Because as, if you're wondering what we're about to do, is use the light model that we can actually try to back out as a result of this sort of you know, creepy, I guess, uh, patterning here to understand how the light is sort of focused in the scene and then understand how that plays against the geometry in the scene to create images. And so this is the normal setup that we did in Minds. We sort of sent these robots, collected these data sets with this rig over here. Here was our Leica prism being, or, or sorry, like a total station tracking the prism over here for as long as we could get it. So here are the remarkable results. 
we didn't just take the data set. We wanted to compare and see where there were current deficiencies associated with the visual SLAM methods that are available today. So many of you, if you've used these technologies, you know that there are three major competing versions of this. One of them is called OKViz, or maybe VINS Mono, or VINS Stereo. These are visual inertial type of systems, which all of them today rely on this feature matching that I was talking about before. The next is this Orb, Orb Slam, which is pretty much the most commonly used visual slam front end today. Um, and that is no IMU, only looking at uh, the, only looking at the uh, visual indirect feature extraction types of matching stuff that I was talking about. The third is this one known as direct sparse odometry, or DSO. So direct sparse odometry eschews the use of indirect sparse features and instead looks at those, those image intensities. Recall how that volleyball changed and shifted, right? We would be tracking that volleyball over time, if you will. Um, and here is, let me, let me break this down for you, this plot up here. So this is saying the number of successful runs, 300 runs in total, the number of successful runs for a particular method where success is defined by the error in alignment, which is essentially the number of meters off at the end the result is, right? And so you can see that if success is defined by only being one meter off at the end, then these methods down here, DSO, as well as orb single, uh, orb slam with a single camera, those don't perform so well. In fact, they perform, they, they may never actually converge even for half the runs, which is pretty, pretty interesting, right? Also interesting is that over here, there's this differentiator where if you use a second sensor, stereo or an IMU, then you have clearly better performance and more accurate performance over time with some uh, saturation, if you will. So that, that sort, of, sort of comports with what we would probably all expect, right? We would say if you add another sensor, it'll be more accurate. Let me show you the failure modes in just a second of that. What's also interesting, though, is it's not just the, that adding another sensor is helpful. It's that if we run the same sequence forward versus backward in running, let's say, like uh, the sequence of images forward versus running the sequence of images in reverse, you have different types of success rates. Now, why would that be? OK, let's look at that for a second. So this is that direct sparse odometry. And let's say that we're starting over here, and we're running our visual system forward, visual slam system forward. And this is the sort of visualization of our map as we're building it. So this is to the starting point, and over here is our ending point. And you can see that even though there's an apparent sort of enlargening of the cave that we are walking in, this doesn't actually happen. That's entirely a result of the errors in the method. right? And over here, this direct sparse odometry method, if we're running it in reverse, that is, we're starting up here, and then we're running the sequence of images backward, that the scale drift happens in the reverse direction. Right? And the reason why is because of this notion of the, uh, what's called the brightness constancy assumption. That is to say, one of the most common things in visual slam, direct visual slam, is this, the statement that if you have an image and it has a certain illumination on it, you capture an image after that, the illumination should be essentially the same. And we all know that's not the case when we have a light attached to, the, to this front end, which means that pretty much every method that you run direct on in this active illumination scenario will break. So all of a sudden, you know, there's this huge ga just gaping hole in the methods that exist. OK. And so here's just this, you know, another way of visualizing these results. Um, what I mean, mean to show here is that DSO actually has this nice, like, we would expect there to be better results, perhaps, if we were looking at this, uh, dropping this brightness constancy assumption. And of course, if you introduce an IMU, then you're sort of golden, right? And, uh, or a second camera. That sort of also stops this scale drift from happening. And yet, direct methods are still very interesting to look at from a research perspective. We still want to be able to say, OK, what happens if we were to consider using direct methods here? So for instance, there's this bar where this, these are the number of times that OrbSlam failed in this one area. 
for 10 runs, it failed all 10 times, independent of the initial seed, if you will. And the reason why OrbSlam, or this, even the stereo version fails, why there's this uh, sort of, on this slide, this asymptote up here below 100% success rate, is because there's always going to be a few frames in which we have complete motion blur. That is to say, we will never be able to capture and correlate different features from frame to frame. So the point be here being, direct methods don't rely on that. And yet direct methods have as their Achilles heel this brightness constancy assumption. So we want to be able to relax that. Um, just to show you this, you know, another visualization of the kinds of ways these methods fail, here's this plot. Um, this one's probably the most true to form as well as metric information associated with one of the runs that we took. And you can see we sort of start off here, we go in, uh, then we go down, then back, and then over here, right? And what you can see is that um, there's this sort of enlargening that happens of this uh, pose graph because of the scale drift from a monocular system. Any monocular system will suffer from this. Okay, with that in mind, we started looking at ways of addressing this. What is this? What is the core of the problem? It's that an image is going to be generated based on geometry, lighting, some albedos or a natural color in the scene, as well as reflectance, the ability for light to be reflected in a certain way against the surface. Okay. So what we essentially are setting up for ourselves is that we want to be able to use RGB and depth, two measurements that we would have in this environment, um, in order to be able to do this, solve the SLAM problem, as well as be able to reconstruct the geometry densely. Okay. So if we look at the kinds of methods like direct sparse odometry that exist today, then what we have is this lightness const or brightness constancy assumption, or lighting being the same throughout the scene. Okay. Here's a truth or what this really should look like. And using DSO as well as these ty typical techniques, that assume brightness to be constant, what we've done is we, we see these sorts of artifacts. And these are not artifacts associated with the rendering. These are artifacts associated with the reconstruction of the surface itself. Okay? Things like just this kind of wavy behavior. If any of you have used anything like Connect Fusion or Elastic Fusion, Dynamic Fusion, this is the kind of behavior that you get when something moves in the scene. It sort of falls off right, in this kind of shaded way. So, a simple question to ask is, what happens if we actually estimate what, how the, the light plays against the surfaces? We're going to have the light moving as we're operating in this environment. So here's the truth. We're going to go ahead and estimate albedos, that is the color of the surfaces. And here we have a reconstruction, which looks kind of nasty. I'm sure many of you would agree. Some of it's this black sort of, these are rendering artifacts, those different uh, shadings and drawings that are happening over the, over the image. But you see, OK, well, maybe it's doing a little bit better. In order to sort of point out to you that I think that there is a lot of research to be done in this field, let's look at the error in the geometry in time, where the top is with the brightness constancy assumption, and the bottom is having sort of relaxed that brightness constancy assumption to allow for a dynamic light source that's sitting on top of the platform. And what you can see is these lighter areas are where there are greater error from the ground truth in the geometry. And you can see that this is sort of just proliferating massively, these errors. Whereas down here, it sort of only exists at the ridges, which is actually where the geometry is most uncertain. So there's a lot of promise in these sorts of methods. If only we could look at how we do light source estimation in a slightly more sophisticated way with respect to these visual SLAM methods. And what that means is, in fact, that I'm going to recall for you this video. What that means is that with better 3D reconstructions, we can do better control and planning, right? Because we can do better reconstructions of how we're going to be interacting against the environment. And so it's going to be more reliable and be able to also fill in these gaps and, and such without having uh, the geometry, if you will, change under us as we're running an MPC. It's huge. And so the last thing is we've been able to sort of do some other kinds of cool stuff with this, including the estimation of light source locations which is sort of doing the same thing as Visual Slam, except allowing for that light source to be able to be estimated in real time. And what this has been able to do is, so this is a, a sort of animation, if you will, of how those uh, light sources, those potential light sources are tessellated in the environment. 
We can do semantic segmentation and albedo estimation using fairly off-the-shelf type of deep neural network techniques and be able to estimate shading and then lighting based on that, which we found to be pretty cool because now we can actually figure out where there are actual light sources in the scene and then understand how shadows are then cast in the environment as well. And in that case, potentially even invert the shadows. So again, I mean, this is, this is all going to this lesson of perception and action informing one another. Moving a, a camera and an active light source in this environment into a scene is going to be helpful for us. It's, if only we understand how that light plays against the geometry. OK, there's one last example that I want to give to you in this vein. And it's related to this problem. So here we have a fairly, I mean, there's some texture on the ground, but on the walls, there may not be too much texture. OK, so if I'm interested in using these indirect methods, these feature-based methods of tracking frame to frame, we don't even know where we should be looking. right? And so I'm going to use some, um, some motivation from this, this chicken. OK, so the chicken is able to stabilize its head which is pretty remarkable, right? Okay, we've all seen this before, probably many of us have. The chicken is, there's actually an amazing soundtrack uh, to this movie that's not playing right now. My apologies. Um, but yeah, I mean, the chicken, what is it doing? Anyone want to take a guess? Besides gimbling, besides biological gimbling? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in a sense, it's interested in this case in trying to focus on, yeah, Mercedes-Benz commercial for stability in cars, uh, interesting perhaps too. Okay, so what it's doing is it's focusing on a certain feature set in the environment. Okay, so it doesn't really like motion blur. The chicken doesn't like motion blur, just like our systems don't like motion blur, right? But the chicken's perfectly fine if it just stays attached, like its gaze is on one thing, and it uses proprioceptive sensors to be able to understand how it's moving with respect to that thing, right? Because it understands how it moves its neck. Pretty basic. Chickens are dumb. Okay. So we thought, okay, well, you know, this is, this is a fairly, you know, this is one step in the right direction. So here we have, I'm, I'm just showing you this video because, you know, it's the first step, if you will. Um, Here's this camera that's sitting on a pan tilt unit, and here's the visual slam solution up here. And what you can see is that it's, we, we're able to track features on the robotic platform by doing this sort of servoing, right? But the chicken head is not really like remarkable just because it can servo well, because a mechanical gimbal could do this. I'm sure many of you have worked with those before, or at least are familiar with them. Um, the chicken head is remarkable because the chicken moves as it's looking at something, and then it saccades as its, as its head's ability to remain focused on something reaches its control limit. Right? So in this case, the chicken sort of stabilizes head, moves forward dramatically, and then, but its body doesn't, it, it doesn't stop moving. Right? It has a mission to accomplish, crossing a road, presumably. Okay. Uh, so here's the idea, right? We put the chicken's head on, a, on this platform here. And what we would like to do is be able to say, stay focused on some set of helpful features, informative features in the environment, landmarks that give me information on state, right? And then move the car around to be able to do whatever it is you want to do, subordinate perception local planning against the global mission, right? So now, essentially, what you could imagine is moving this, this robot around and being able to focus on things. And that's the point of future work that we're working on right now. Um, but what I wanted to show is um, sort of some of the, the simulations that we have and the formulation that we've taken on this problem. So we've, we've reduced our state vector just to translation, velocity, and some biases on the gyro. And interestingly, or interestingly for us, uh, sorry, biases on the IMU per time step k. And what we've done is we've reduced the camera information to informativeness on our state vector, as well as informativeness on landmarks. So this is, if you will, our generative model for our camera measurements. And over here, sorry for this color, that didn't really turn out so well. But here we have informativeness of the IMU, which you could imagine as being just something where we're saying, well, the IMU is going to give us information anyway. So that means we're going to be moving the camera's field of view 
such that we're complementing the information we have from the IMU. Right? And from this, we can say each landmark, we can actually quantify the amount of information each landmark has as a result of this sort of total information per measurement. Okay? We can also do the same, if you will, for some future time horizon h at time step k for each of our IMU measurements. And what, you could, you, what we're going to be doing is saying, OK, that means our total information is our sum of the information per landmarks that are currently visible in this set S, as well as the IMU information that we get for free. Right? The IMU is always going to be operating. It doesn't matter what coordinate frame it's in. So here's our problem. We're trying to take the maximum over possible sets of view, subsets of view S within the field of view F, subject to some co-visibility constraints during the fixation. That is to say, we're going to fixate on certain types of regions, S, and we're taking the maximum over these regions, S. Okay. And in that region, S, there are some landmarks that we can calculate the information on. Okay. This requires the introduction of some sort of information metric. We use the log determinant information metric on this. There are a lot of examples about different ways the Fisher information matrix actually shows the amount of information that we might have. Log determinant we've been found, we found to be pretty useful for computational purposes, as well as just use. I mean, it, it seems to represent a volume of information rather than a major axis. Let's say. So what we're trying to do is, you know, essentially say if we were given this hallway scene, look at all the features that are right here that might not be able to provide us information for very long if we're moving in this direction, but look at all the features maybe further down the hallway or perhaps slightly to the left or right because they'll give us information that complement our IMU. And we're doing this in a three-dimensional environment of this so-called hallway uh, if, as an example, just because hallways are nice and blank on some walls and have some features in others. So here's a, here's a video of that running. Um, and what we have is this simulated hallway trajectory in which we have a camera's frustrum looking at these different landmarks in this environment. And here's a visualization in visual slam world uh, with the IMU being giving us information as well as the visual front end actually being the thing that's that, that is processing the images. That is the only component processing the images. So we are able to do here what's, I mean, many of you, uh, you know, you, you might look at this and you say, what should, I be, what should I be asking the question about here? It's that these are the only landmarks in the scene. Everything else is blank, right? There's no landmarks besides these tiny little panels that we've set up. And we're still not losing tracking because we're able to look at the panels as we're sort of flying across them. So even in this extraordinarily visually sparse environment, we're able to st still recreate uh, slam uh, path or a state estimate um, reliably. OK, so we think that's pretty cool. Um, and we're able to also do it by selecting subregions of images in a uh, fairly common TUM, data, TUM indoor data set um, and being able to compare those rather than doing full uh, calculations of visual slam against the entire image, which we find to be also sort of uh, suggesting that these kinds of saccading methods are even more powerful than just, say, putting up a panoramic camera. And so these are things that you can see uh, what's coming up next at the Urban Circuit. So that's February 18th through the 27th. We're going to be deploying to Satsop Business Park in Olympia, Washington. It's much colder there. It's snowing. They're not heating the garage. It's going to be great. Uh, and, but anyway, so we'll be up there for 10 days and uh, deploying teams of robots in similar conditions to what we've done before. Um, we've had a lot of fun with doing this, and I just want to remark that working with DARPA and working on these sorts of projects has been um, very motivating for the team and for me. It sort of allowed us to pursue many different research directions at the same time, to have undergrads and postdocs working with one another, building systems uh, that are not just, you know, like um, caveman type systems, in my opinion. They're really like sophisticated. Uh, capabilities for mesh networking, for being able to do joint relocalization, being able to do different kinds of task management, et cetera. And finally, also just building out robotic platforms, something that unfortunately doesn't get done very often in our field. Right? It's, it takes an enormous number of resources and hours to be able to build these platforms. But it's been uh, one of the joys of my first few years of being an assistant professor at the University of Colorado to be able to, to actually have teams of students 
working together, building these platforms, and then running them not only in what DARPA is interested in, but also uh, running them in agricultural settings, um, different kinds of partnerships with Boulder Rescue, wild, uh, wildfire management services, um, U.S. Forest Service, Hot Shots, et cetera, which has been a real fun, fun time. Um, so yeah, we're looking forward to going out there again uh, just, to, just to show off. We did actually field some of our um, parkour cars in the first competition. We sort of gave them nicer wheels uh, for, for working in mud. And here's a picture of our team. And uh, I'm going to conclude today by just uh, showing off a video of, of our operating in this environment, which is a time-lapse video. or well, not time-lapse. It's the opposite. It's reducing the video to once every four frames. Here are some fiducials that we need to navigate against to make sure we're in DARPA's reference frame. And again, like the whole mission was to find these sorts of different artifacts and things in this kind of, uh, look at all these specular highlights, different screwdrivers that are anywhere. Um, the specular highlights and everything that would normally cause issues with state estimators, uh, the sort of things that we've been able to do have really robustified them against dark environments like this one. Um, and being able to operate over different types of terrain and, uh, and cooperate with one another as we're operating, which has been, like I said, a real joy. Uh, you know, we did fairly well in the first competition. Here's us, Team Marble, fourth place. Um, and uh, we hope to continue moving up in the world. Explore is CMU. No? Okay. Everyone here loves CMU, apparently. Uh, yeah, okay. And so, yeah, I look forward to, you know, doing, going to the next competition. Anyway, but I'm happy to take questions, and uh, thanks for your attention. So I'm guessing we don't have time for questions. Uh, I would love to make maybe one or two questions. Maybe I'll ask you one more quick then. Uh, in terms of uh, doing the perception, the kind of active perception with the gimbal, uh, are you doing any planning in terms of uh, trying to plan ahead of time where you're planning to look at? And if you're doing that, how are you knowing ahead of time where the features are going to be? Yeah, so right now we have only uh, pre-mapped environments that we're doing this against, um, which you might say is kind of, uh, you know, how exciting is that? But what we're planning on doing is being able to just have a very simple heuristic based on convolutional neural networks, in fact, that are conditioned on the types of environments that we're in as a prior is different places that we should be looking. But it's the same. We are looking over currently planned horizons. So really, all that's the missing ingredient is where are the landmarks, which can e easily be just like, a, like I said, a prior, a probabilistic prior distribution of of landmarks, which is what we plan on doing. But yeah, we are currently doing planning over um, time horizons that are given to us by planners. So in fact, this takes uh, sort of a page out of the, um, I guess it's Luca Carlone's work on attention and anticipation and visual inertial slam, uh, being able to say, we have a planner, let's use it. So yeah, cool. From the second speaker. Okay, thank you.